I want to thank Brother Lawson for the materials he's presented in Bible class this morning. You're going to find some parallels between our materials today, which is going to be a blessing for all of us as we continue to dive into God's Word. I have a question for you. How many this morning, as you're getting dressed in your closets or in your bedrooms, how many of you decided that you went to one period, you got some clothing out, and then you didn't want to wear that, so you threw that either on your bed, or you threw it on your nightstand, or you laid it maybe perhaps in your bench in your closet? And maybe you went a second time even to get a th another pair of clothing for a third time. And when you get home today, you're going to have clothing laying somewhere in your house that has to be put away. How many? Don't, don't raise your hand. Well, some of y'all did, which... How many of you men who've tied a tie today took more than once? This is my third tie to try today. Same tie, but third try. Um, it, it's just one of those things. It's a rare occasion that I go throw a tie on that it goes the first time. Well, as you can see, we're not going to talk about our clothing. And, and when you get home, I hope you, you can put your clothing away. But we're not going to talk about what you dressed in today in your clothing. There's a lot more important things that we need to be studying in God's Word than actually the clothing that we're wearing physically. And so I wanted today to spend a few minutes, if we may, in God's Word to look at the aspects of clothing. If you have your Bible open, if you're going to, we're going to spend most of our time in Colossians chapter 3. So we go ahead and turn there and put a marker there. We will go to a few other passages. Some of the scriptures will be on the screen for our reading together, but some I'll ask you to turn to. In the first portion of the third chapter here in Colossians 3, we see a number of admonitions that the Apostle Paul writes here to the Christians living in Colossae. A lot of these had to do with living the full Christian life. They had to do with the complete life in Jesus Christ. And just to look at a few of these, beginning in verse 1, if you can see here. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, very important question. He said, keep seeking the things where? Above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on this earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also be revealed with Him in glory. So we see here in the first four verses, He says, focus on things that are heavenly. Brothers and sisters, Life wasn't a whole lot different then than it is today that there's many distractions. And our brother Lawson talked about that this morning in Bible class, that we have so many distractions. I'm speaking on the same thing here regarding these are it's my life too. As I read this, these are things that we constantly be reminded of, focused on. We won't read together the verses 5 through 9, but you can see in that area he talks about slaying the earthly things, those things that, that are those passions of ours that we have and Sometimes we have to put those to death. We have to lay those aside. We have to get rid of those in our life. And I have to confess, those are not easy. These are not easy things to adhere to. And I believe our brothers and sisters living here in Colossae struggle just as much as you and I do today as we look at these passages. I believe that's why the letter was written. And in verses 10 through 11, he talks about strengthening the faithful. Beginning in verses 8 through 10, though, in this passage here, we find that the Apostle Paul starts using a metaphor. And you'll see this, if you hi ever highlight in your Bible, you'll see these two metaphors used throughout this passage here about putting aside certain things or putting them off, some translations may read. Put those things aside. That means that those things are present right now in your life, but you need to grab hold of those and get them out of your way. These were not going to be easy things for them. They're not easy for us today either. He also finds the necessity to tell them there are certain things you need to put on. And these are the idea of the clothing that we're going to talk about today, putting these things on. It's just like getting dressed in the morning. He says these are necessities of you're going to grow as a Christian. You've got to put these things aside. So he says, but now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed 
to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Well, who was the one who created him? Was it not Jesus in the creation? Was it not God the Father at the creation and the Holy Spirit as they created us? As we decide to make the decision to be put on Christ, we are born again. We are new. Old things are gone. New things have come. He reminds of these things about laying certain things aside. I'd like to draw our attention, though, now to verse 12. He continues here in the passage that we had read for us this morning. He expands upon the qualities that Christians are to put on. Now, this is not going to be a word study this morning. We're going to simply look at a few of these. I hope this will challenge you, though, to spend a little bit more time in this passage. We don't have time today to look at all of these. But we'll look at a few of these together. In verses 12 through 17, we will see from the perspective of the constitutes to what we call, sometimes you may have heard these things, the Christian apparel. I'm simply going to say these are the things, the clothing that we put on, the attributes we wear as a Christian. We are to put these on, and they are to be properly put on. For us to be properly dressed, we put all these songs in a, sense, in a particular order. Notice if you would, though, beginning in verse 12, or again, we'll read together. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let's observe from these passages some of the eight attributes here, he says. Again, we're not going to go deep into each of these because we don't have time today. He describes here the first of these and the first two seem to be the, the, just the, how we are to treat other people. Now, sometimes, uh, Brother Wayne says this, and I agree completely, sometimes we're hard to get along with, aren't we? Maybe you're not. I am occasionally. Okay. But these are things that the Christians in Colossae were challenged to grow in, challenged to change in. Now that you're in Christ, you're supposed to wear new clothing, Take off the old ones and put these on. And the first one he talks about, and I'm going to kind of go back to some of the original language here a little bit because he talks about a heart of compassion. And the original King James and some of the old language talks about the bowels of mercy. You know, and the Hebrew people thought that the emotions came from the bowels deep within. Today we, we find an idea that we use the word heart more frequently. We are to have a heart that is soft, a heart that is wanting to allow others in. And we are to show that compassion, that mercy. Now, I have to confess, this is a learned trait, too. And, and so the Christians in Colossae, and, and you and I, this is something we can learn. I have often heard people say, well, that's just the way I am. Well, brothers and sisters, that's the way some of them were. I, I love the letter to the Corinthians, especially in chapter 6, where Paul lists the, the great sins these people were part of. But then he says, and such were some of you. That's how he wants the Christians at Colossae to be as well. And that's how he wants us as we read this to say, maybe I was like that. But now in Christ, I know there's hope for me and I can change. I can have these bowels of mercy or this heart of compassion to be able to show compassion for other people. And then he says a second one that goes along with that, to how we are to treat others. And that is the idea of kindness. And many translations will use other words of gentleness or, or being able to bear with someone other or wrong that's been done against you. Showing courtesy to someone who has done something wrong to you. And these are traits we grow in. They're not naturally there. But they're something we work towards. I believe the next two depict a state of mind, though, as well. You know, we don't always wake up every morning with a proper state of mind, do we? I mean, we get up to certain days feeling better than others. Some days where it seemed like we're on, the, on track. But here's it says it's a state of mind that the Christian needs to start putting on every morning. 
Now, I confess, just like some of you, I, I do enjoy that some of you participated with saying you left some clothes laying out today. Maybe you got up in certain, one particular morning and you, and you had a certain type of tire on in regard to this attitude of humility. But something happened in the day and that changed. Well, we are to have the humbleness of mind, and, and this is not easy in our day and time. He says we are to work towards having a humbling a mind, a sincere, not just a, a fake, but a sincere, humble opinion of oneself. That's a challenge. Because many in our society, we're even told often about to take care of yourself, think of yourself, promote yourself. The Christian attributes that Jesus wants us to be wearing, though, have a humble state. We are to think more highly of someone else, especially our brothers and sisters. But a lowly state of ourself, a modesty, a humility of mind. And brothers and sisters, that's something we have to work on. I say we because I can. I'm guessing you're probably like me in some of those areas. And we have to work on those qualities. He lays down the second one like that as well, that it's a state of mind, of gentleness, a mildness, re receiving one another. Many people who have different, as your brother was talking this morning, Gary was talking about this morning in Bible class, we have those we imitate and we look to to think about how we've learned to have a mentor. And I don't want to get sidetracked or too emotional of that, but one of the greatest examples I had of gentleness was my dad. My dad was 6'5", he was quite st stocky in strength too, but it, at one of our best friends, or my best friend's dad described my dad as a gentle giant, and that was the nature he had. You know, and, and I, I think he imitated Christ in that, and I think there, there's ideas we see that we have to work on those temperaments, we have, to, we have to grow in those areas, they're not something that we're born with. We have to work towards those ideas. He goes on in the next part of our text is here to talk about some other virtues, how they relate to when we are mistreated. Do you see in there also the idea of patience? How many of you have patience as your greatest virtue? Raise your hand. Ah, you're with me. We need to work on that one, right? Well, he says we are to have patience with one another. Patience with wrong, Jesus teaches. Patience when dealing with others. Patience when we are in an environment that is hostile. We are to work on that patience idea of when someone does something to us, we are slow to speak, slow to anger, and not quick to retaliate. He speaks on the subject also of the clothing about bearing with one another. In Galatians chapter 6, we talk about bearing one another's burdens there. Here in this passage, he talks about bearing with one another. That's the idea of sustaining or helping someone when they're in trouble or when someone is really in hardship, helping them along on their journey. Remember how Jesus hailed others. Remember how Jesus acted when he was being crucified. Remember how he acted when he was being spit upon and slapped and mocked. Remember what he did. Now, the second to last one of these is forgiving each other or one another. How many of y'all are great at that? I'm not seeing a lot of raising of hands because I think we all need to work on these qualities just like I do. The Holy Spirit that writes though through Paul, understanding that this is a quality and attribute that we constantly must work on putting on. It says doing something pleasant or agreeable for someone when they've done something wrong to us. Turning the other cheek. Praying for their forgiveness. Asking the Father to forgive them. All examples that we're taught. Forgiving others, though, brothers and sisters, is, a, is one that is not a suggestion. Why is that? The text tells us, doesn't it? Because we were first forgiven. Because Jesus forgave you. If you're in Christ today, just as the passage in chapter 3 begins in verse 1, we'll read together in just a minute. Just as it began, if we're in Christ and we're in new, we have been forgiven. What a wonderful blessing that is. We, we want to be forgiven. The final one in this passage, 
The virtue is love. Most of you have heard a number of lessons on the, the word agape and what it means. Having that good will or that benevolence towards someone. I believe the Apostle Paul describes it pretty well in this passage. And another way we're going to look at is that bond of perfection. It's that bond that holds everything else together. It is that quality that kind of wraps everything else together. All the qualities that we just looked at together. These virtues. Brother, this morning in Bible class was talking about girding up ourselves. Here that same idea is this belt of love that we are to have that holds all the other virtues together. Without love, none of these other virtues can last. And that is just the way it is, he says. But with it, with it, all the others come much easier. Don't raise your hand on these. You can think about this. How many of you think that you are easy to love? Just think about that for just a moment. But also wanted to think also, how many of you can look around the auditorium here, all the people, your brothers and sisters, your son with them, say, you know what, those folks, every one of them is just easy to love. I struggle with that too. I'm not always easy to love, nor are all of you easy to love. Because we all have areas that we get on each other's nerves. The Christians at Colossae were the same way. They came from various backgrounds. And some of them did things that irritated others. But he says, put on love. It's that perfect bond. You see, together with all these things that we just read, he goes into this idea of the character and nature of Christ that we're putting on. We're putting on these qualities. If we are clothed with these virtues, and we are working towards getting clothed with these virtues each and every day, we'll be clothing ourselves with the character of Christ. I cannot speak for you, but I want to be wearing and looking like Christ. I pray all the time about this, and I work towards it, but I'm not there. I think the Apostle Paul said it well. He was pressing on for that prize. To look like and have the character of Christ. And Paul wants that for the Christians here in Colossae. He wants it here for the Christians here in Circe. As Jesus would say that we are to imitate him, Paul said the same thing about imitating him as he imitates Christ. I want you to consider this passage with me here again in Colossians 3. Is this not the very nature of what Paul is saying to us here in verses 9 and 10? Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. Let me ask you a question before we read any farther. This is one of those lay aside things. You've laid aside those evil practices. How often, though, do these evil practices want to find themselves back to us? Or do we find ourselves wanting to creep that direction? I heard years ago the idea of when you want to, the old saying, bury the hatchet. No, you don't bury a hatchet because you know where it's buried at. You want to go back and dig it up occasionally. And that's the same as with these virtues here. He said you lay them aside. You don't put them in your same path anywhere near you. You get them as far away as you can. But it goes on here, he says, that you've laid aside his old ways. And have put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge, according to the image of who created him. Let me ask you a question, just something to consider. I was thinking about the Christians here in Classe. And just considering now today, do you all know there is no longer a congregation of the Lord's Church in the city of Classe? Wouldn't it have been wonderful if we could be more successful at putting on the character of Christ? Speak for ourselves and speak for them. Think about the churches that could have been spared the divisions and the contentions that were going on with them both in the first century, in the second century, third century, and even today. Think about all these things. Think about the families that could have been saved if Christians had clothed themselves with these qualities. Back then and right now. I want us to remind us, though, if you look back at the earlier part of this letter, it begins about seeking the heavenly. Every day, 
and not slaying the earthly every day. As long as it's called today. Also along with the, the character of Christ, we must put on and clothe ourselves also. And this is one that I think we all want, and that is the peace of Christ. We all want to be at peace with God, and we want to be at peace with Christ, but we also need to be striving to have the peace of Christ he speaks of here. Look at your Bible again in verse 15. I know it's on the screen with you for you. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let this rule in our lives. I want to ask you the question, why? Why does he suggest that we have this? Why does he command the Christians there to allow this to rule? And that is the reason is we've been called, he says. We've been called in one body, the church. And that one calling commands that we live differently. Brothers and sisters, this is not to be taken lightly. Jesus died on the cross to make peace. Did we not remember that? I have to remind myself of that occasionally. Jesus Christ died on that cross to make peace for us. A passage that we're probably familiar with. I'm going to turn your Bible to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. Now, there's a couple types of peace he speaks of here. But I'm reminded, if he died to make peace between those who are hostile towards one another, the Jew and the Greek, if his peace dying on the cross could accomplish that, it could accomplish anything. The Holy Spirit writes through the servant Paul, through the church at Ephesus, for he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing his flesh, the enmity, which the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. And he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off or far away. And peace to those who were near. For through Him, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. I read this quote a number of years ago and I'll, that I'll share with you. I can't even tell you who said this, but it, it stuck with me. One preacher said, if we disrupt the peace of the body of the church, we disrupt the work of Christ on the cross. That hung with me. Maybe think about that. He went on to say, Thus we must be diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3. What I've seen in my life, maybe you have as well, and this speaks to me, it speaks to you, that generally where there is contention and strife, it's among members of the body of Christ who are not letting the peace of Christ rule in their lives. Now, this is not the conclusion of this sermon, but maybe we're sitting here today, maybe you're sitting here today, and that has been a struggle in your life. Today at the invitation, I want to encourage you, whether it's public or private, that maybe you would think about that and, and ask for forgiveness if necessary, to, and ask the Lord to help you to allow the peace that He wants you to have, that peace that passes all understanding, to just dwell in you. You see, peace in the body, the church begins with peace ruling in our hearts and our lives, that bowels of mercy. It begins, it has to be beginning with us. So the question asked, we had to ask, and we're going to answer that today based on God's word. How do we let the peace of Christ rule in our heart? Maybe that's a question you ponder. Maybe you've thought about the lot of your life. It must start with our setting our minds on things above, just as the beginning of this letter in chapter 3 says, about setting our mind on things that are not of this world, but on things that are of God. And thinking about where Jesus is seated right now at the right hand of the Father. Remember, this passage assumes that we are participating with this admonition there in Colossians 3. All this is said, assuming you have done this and you are making these decisions and you're setting your mind on these things. He says, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, there's a question there. 
Then keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. Did you do that today yet? Looks like to me these are things that I need to work on every day. Not just on Sundays, not just on particular days of the week. But each day of the week. I'm reminded also that only a mind that's fixed on the spiritual things. Again, I'm, these are struggles. But only a mind that's set on the, phys, on the spiritual things can enjoy that peace with God. If you want to turn over, it's written on the screen for you to read along with me, but if you think about what the passage here in Romans 8 speaks of. Paul, the servant here, speaks to our brothers in Rome. He reminds them, again, amongst those living amongst this Roman Empire, for those who are according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. For those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. That peace of God, that peace of Christ that we want to have, that we want to follow. Paul also tells us back in our text in Colossians 3, he reminds us how important it is to engage and be thankful. There in our text again, verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be a thankful people. Be thankful each and every day for what He did for you on that cross. Be thankful for the blessings. Now there's another passage I want to turn to and, and this is a, another great parallel. I think he, the Apostle Paul as the Holy Spirit wrote through him Ties these together more beautifully here. Look at these passages together. He makes this connection between the, the prayerful and thankful spirit and the peace of God. Philippians 4, beginning of verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He speaks of that dwelling spot where we think on the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. In our attitude of prayerfulness and thankfulness, and when we do this and we are walking and clothing ourselves, he said, then we can have peace. I think it also comes as we follow the examples, both of Jesus and the, as the apostles. Speaking of here, we're looking at what Paul wrote. In the same letter we just read a couple verses later, look what the apostle Paul writes to the brothers there in Philippi. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. Practice supposedly makes better, right? Practice helps us to get better at things. Paul would all say other places we just mentioned a minute ago that he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And I think that was his complete purpose in life was imitating Christ. Paul tells the Christians there in Philippi, and he said the same thing in Colossae, imitate me. Because I am working every day of my life to make Christ. And if you, if you follow those and hear those, those things I've taught you and you've seen in me, you also can have the peace that Christ wants you to have. Brothers and sisters, again, how wonderful it would be if churches and families and all professing Christians we would work harder at and make it an ambition in our life to clothe ourselves with the qualities of the character of Christ and having the peace of Christ. This morning I asked two questions of us to think on this morning. And the sermon's yours. Are you clothed right now where you're sitting? Are you clothed with the character of Christ? 
Does he see all the qualities we looked at today? Does he see those present in my life? Does he see those qualities? Do the brothers and sisters sitting in the assembly with me, do they, do they see those qualities right now in my life? You're the only one that can answer that. And I have to answer for myself. And the second one I'm going to ask you this morning, are you allowing the peace of Christ and the peace of God, the Father, to rule in your life? To me, I find it easy occasionally to say, I'm allowed to have His presence. I'm allowed to have His stay for a little while. But I struggle, perhaps like you, to allow Him to rule in my life. I want to exhort us today as a, as a family of God and family of Christians who come to worship today to make it our ambition to clothe ourselves with Christ. And if today you're here and you're not a Christian yet, perhaps you'd like to see in God's Word how you are to become a Christian. We'd be happy to open your Bibles with you and let you see from your Bible what God would call you to do, how to become a child of God. Learn of Him. Repent of the ways in your life. Turn from those. Be washed in the blood of Jesus in baptism. And arise a new creature, working towards putting on the character of Christ. Maybe you are this morning also the one that has struggled with these things, and maybe peace is not present in your life right now. Maybe there's so many distractions. Jesus desires for you to have his peace. We first must ask him to help us. We may have to get things out of the way. But let me encourage you today, if you're not in Christ, to become one today if possible. If not, seek out the ways and study our Bibles together to see how. But if you're seeking to have that peace of Christ, let me encourage you to exhort you today to pursue that. Let's stand together as we sing.